So many of you may be familiar with it. Some of you might even have it as a framed poster up on the walls of your home. It's that passage, Footsteps in the Sand. You might know what I'm talking about. It goes something like this. A man has reached the end of his earthly life, and he's come face to face with God. And before going on, God invites him to turn around and have a look at the panorama that is the life that he's led. And what he sees is a nice beach and footsteps in the sand on the beach. Now, most of the way back to the moment of his birth, he sees two parallel lines of footsteps. But there's a few spots where, strangely, one of those lines disappears. And he only sees one set of footsteps. And in bewilderment, he turns to God and says, God, I don't understand. I recognize those as the most difficult and painful moments in my life. Why was it that in those moments you abandoned me? And God says to him, oh, my precious child, I would never leave you or abandon you. I didn't leave you in those moments. Those were the ones where I carried you. Now, it's a beautiful passage. But I maintain it has left something out. See, I think when the man turned around, he not only saw places with a dual set of footsteps and a single set of footsteps, he also saw a few places where there were no footsteps at all, but instead just wild patterns in the sand and what appeared to be scuff marks. And he asked God, well, what about those? And God said, oh, well, those are the places where you and I duped it out like cats and dogs, and I hope I didn't put you out of joint. I apologize if I did. Well, my friends, I wish you the most merry of Christmases. I hope you're enjoying an evening filled with family, with joy, with beloved traditions. But at the same time, I'm going to warn you, fasten your seatbelts. Christmas is not for the faint of heart. Because if the Christmas message is what we have received this night, it is nothing less than this. The all-powerful, unlimited intelligence that gave its being, its birth, to everything that is, seen and unseen, including you and me, that unlimited power and intelligence showed up on earth as one of us equal to us. If that is true, sisters and brothers, it means something that is beyond the capability of our imagination to really encapsulate. It means that we, that you and that I, have been made equal to God. If that doesn't keep you up tonight, I don't think you're really pondering. You and I have been made equal to God. Now that may sound wonderful and miraculous, and it is, but it's also a heavy burden. It means that we are not only invited, but obligated to live our lives with incredible boldness, with boldness and creativity and imagination that always exceeds what we might be doing in any given moment. Think about a small child. You go into a kindergarten classroom and you ask the kids, what are you going to be when you grow up? I'm worried about the kid who doesn't give you a really big dream. I'm going to be an astronaut. I'm going to be the president of the United States. I'm going to start my own company. That's the kind of thing you tend to hear. That and more is what the Christmas message not only invites, but even demands of us. As our lives go on, we tend to contract them a little bit. We tend to live smaller. We tend to live to let the disappointments and failures teach us, well, I guess that dream was too big, so I better make it a little bit smaller and more manageable. And Christmas says no. Christmas says you had it right when you were five. If you're going around asking, who am I to dream this big and to act this bold, God, who made you equal to God, is saying, I beg your 
garden, but if you are my equal, who are you to not dream that big and act that bold? So my friends, I don't care if you are eight or 80 this night. It's that huge dream of the small child to which God calls you and says, guess what? Today is your day, no matter how many times you feel like the world has slapped you down. But the Christmas message not only tells us that we are equal with God, it tells us something that's perhaps even a little harder to practice. And I say that by looking around at today's world. It's that we are radically equal to one another. Now, I recently read an interview at the Rotary Club of New Delhi in India with an Indian sage named Sadhguru. And he recounted a little bit of a conversation he had with his preteen daughter. She made it to the age of 12, and he had practically said and done nothing to limit or guide her in any way. He had really gone with the philosophy of childhood is truly meant to be childhood. As long as the child is doing no harm to self or others, let them simply experience and explore the world and begin to draw their conclusions from it. But one day his 12-year-old daughter came to him and said, you know, Father, it has been stated by notice that you guide and offer wisdom to just about everybody in the world you encounter except me. What's going on with that? And his response to her was, well, I never offer that unsolicited. And this is the first time you've asked. So, now that you've asked, I gladly oblige. And I have only one thing to tell you. Never regard anyone as being above you. Not a soul on this planet, and that includes me. Never regard anyone as being below you. Not a soul on this planet. And that includes me. If God came to us in the flesh and made us equal to God, it's absurd to think that there could be any hierarchy or gradation between us creatures. We are told never regard anyone, old or young, black or white, male or female, it does not matter. Never regard anyone as being above us or below us. Now that might sound like the American ideal, it's written into our Declaration of Independence after all. All men are created equal, we assume that uh, in the older English this applies all people are created equal. But, do we really practice it? I'm going to maintain that it's an untested idea. Think about some of the most controversial politicians that have been making the press so much in recent years. There seems to be one of two reactions to them. Either they are utterly demonized and vilified, they are spoken of as if every word that comes out of their mouths is a curse word, they are subhuman. Or else they are somehow placed in this superhuman category where they are not fallible beings with whom we can engage, but sort of these automatons that dictate wisdom and righteousness without fail. I'm going to maintain these are two sides of the same coin. No matter which one we're doing, we are objectifying a human being that we were always meant to engage with as difficult and messy a work as that might be, as an equal on a level playing field. It's not just that. I can think of other examples. The hordes of people arriving at our borders with nothing but what they're carrying on their backs, begging for a new life. Again, two general reactions. One is subhuman. Turn them away. There's no room. It's going to ruin the fabric of our society. The other is superhuman. No one can dare to even question this. It must be accepted at all costs. Both do unbelievable damage to the fabric of humanity, the fabric of our society. Both take 
living, breathing human beings with whom we were always meant to engage as subject and turn them into object. It doesn't matter if it is a subhuman or a superhuman object. It's the same problem either way. And then, let's be honest, let's bring it closer to home. The Christian church in its 20 centuries of existence has had a rather checkered past in its engagement with people and communities of other faiths. Either subhuman, they are wrong, they are meant to be regarded with tremendous suspicion and excluded perhaps from the body politic, or superhuman, but because of what they endured, they are somehow perhaps even morally superior to us. Again, two sides of the same coin. If we are to take the Christian message seriously, we're going to have to try to do something that I'm going to insist in the entirety of human evolution we've never done terribly well. And that is look in the eyes of every 